All right. Good evening, Oral Baptist Church and brethren. It's another evening in which we can uh, share and study together God's Word. I know that this has been a, another interesting week, and um, as we look towards, Lord willing, being able to get back together after being apart for so long, I know that's a, a highlight of hope that each one of us has, and it's just amazing to me how the things that we're studying here, the things that we're studying, that I'm studying with my family in the book of Jeremiah, and just really speaks to the things that um, we are seeing today and that we're facing individually as families and as a nation. So I trust that the word, the book of uh, Lamentations is going to be a blessing to us tonight. I wanted to start off with just a little bit of review. Um, and remember where we came from. That Lamentations means, right, to cry or to mourn or to lament. To express sorrow. And it reminds us of the suffering servant, and we'll actually see, um, and I think I mentioned it last week, but actually we'll see that there are certain passages in the chapter that we're looking at tonight that correspond to um, the, the uh, prophetic um, representation of the Lord himself, and have always been included in um, the celebration of the week of the Lord's death and resurrection. So, um, I'm looking forward to looking at that. Um, Jeremiah, uh, the Lord himself, the man of sorrows, was acquainted with grief, and Jeremiah... Um, expressed it beforehand, but knew, and he and he came to some very interesting realizations, as we'll see tonight. Um, I want to go back and ask this question: What about pain? Is pain fair? And truly, there is no concept of fair in the world today. Um, righteousness is broken down. Righteousness is usually, at, at, at the best of times, is very narrow. You know, you can, um, some people, some governments will execute righteousness um, in certain areas for a short time and to particular groups of people, um, so a very narrow swath, as it were. And that's never fair. But we know that when Christ comes, he will be a fair, a, that is to say a just and a righteous judge, and he will treat um, people as is proper and is um, that he should. Is justice for pain something to be sought? Should we hold people accountable who hurt us or who hurt others? That's the question. That's the motivation behind that question. right? This was things that we considered at the very beginning of our study. And like I said, it's amazing how um, appropriate it is for today. Is there a permanent solution? Yes, Lord willing. And how does this perspective give us hope in working through our own pain? So as we come to Lamentations chapter 3 today, um, I trust that you will be able to see this is the highlight of the whole book. Okay, This is the apex 
of the Book of Lamentations. This is the centermost um, of the five poems, and you really get to the heart and the crux of the topic that Jeremiah wants to present. Even so, it is well flanked by a serious and a hard look at pain and sorrow and suffering. I can't say personally that I have experienced pain um, in any deep or meaningful sense. Um, I've seen unrest um, when I was reading the stories about the precincts in Minneapolis being torched. It was quite a, a flashback to 1997 in, our, in, in, in my young life when we lived in the city of Vlor in Albania and the police were run out of town by protesters. And the, the, the level of uncertainty and unrest and um, uh, just not knowing you know how to proceed, how to react, is certainly there. And the Lord protected us. Um, and our family left the country at that point. And um, we actually left on our own power. We, we bought our own tickets and left unlike people who stayed another two months and were evacuated by um, National Guard helicopters. So we've, we've been here before, we've seen this. Um, however, it didn't touch us, um, but only kind of a glancing blow. I mean, we lost pretty much everything that we had um, because we had to leave with what we could fit in a suitcase and just walk away from it, you know. Um, however, it didn't, we weren't harmed physically, right? We weren't harmed, we weren't in harm's way at that particular moment. And, but mentally and emotionally and spiritually, the church in Vlor was completely disbanded. We had members moving to Belgium and to Greece and to Italy and we came back to the United States and, you know, um, Germany and other places throughout Europe. And so there was, you know, the unrest was a detriment, at least it seemed to us, and in, in that particular moment was a detriment to the testimony of the gospel in that place and at that time. Um, however... The Lord has rebuilt. Um, we have dear friends that have returned to the area, are doing a great work, and um, many of the of the you know those who were truly saved are never truly are never again lost, and so um, relationships were were maintained, and now they as as you know some semblance of peace returned to Albania. Um, there is a viable church there in Vlor um, as we speak. So we have something to look forward to beyond the pain and the, and the violence and the unrest. Um, let's go to our scripture and look at what the Bible says here in the book of uh lamentations chapter 3 lamentations chapter 3 um says i am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his power i'm sorry by the rod of his wrath he hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me is he turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin hath he made old.
He hath broken my bones. He hath builded against me, encompassed me about with gall and travail. He hath sent me, set me in dark places, as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about, and I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. Also, when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He hath made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait, and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my way and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. He hath bent his arrow and set me as a mark for the arrow, and hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunk and with wormwood. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity. And I said, My strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore have I hope. We're going to stop there and continue in prayer. Father, this evening as we look at your word, touch our hearts, break through our reserves and our, our crusty minds and our, our ways of thinking and our ways of feeling and our presuppositions and cause us to see afresh and anew a immediate vision of the Lord. And may His presence feel us just as it did here for Jeremiah, so that we can confess with him that you are our hope. This we ask and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The first verse was um is one that I have um thought about a lot. The verse um it says I am ani um the Hebrew word ani starts with an a or an alpha. And so this is the centermost uh paragraph of the centermost poem, sorry, of the five poems of lamentations. Um, it's got 66 verses in it. Now, that sounds like a lot, but actually, um, the, it has the same amount of, of lines of text. It has the same amount of lines of text as the other the two chapters that we've already seen. Whereas the other chapters, like verse 1, had three lines in the Hebrew. The first line started with alpha, right? And then two lines. The second verse had three lines. The first line started with beta and so on. You know, alphabet comes from the two Hebrew words, aleph, beth, right? The two first letters of the, of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, here, Instead of each, um, instead of there being three lines for every verse, it's still three lines for every verse, but here they have separated them out and they have actually numbered each individual line. And so the first three lines, all three start with alpha. The lines four, five, and six start with beta, right? 
lines seven, eight, and nine, and so on, as you know, you can you can fill in the blank there, right? It goes down through the alphabet three lines at a time, three lines to each letter. And so, um, and they numbered them, they numbered each line rather than each verse, and so they numbered 66 verses in chapter three, even though um, it's the same number, it's 66 lines was in each of the in each of the former two chapters. It's just that three lines went to a verse. All right. Um, that first line, I am a man that has seen affliction, reminds me of um, a Mississippi movie. Probably some of y'all have seen it. I'm going to show you really quick here a, um, a little clip of it, um, I think, or maybe not. But it was the 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 little poem um, from the Soggy Bottom Boys. Um, I am a man of constant sorrow, and uh, let me see if I can play it here. All right, so it's not working for me. That's fine. But the, in the book, O oh Brother, Where, in the movie, O oh, oh Brother, Where Art Thou? The Zaggy Bottom Boys sing that song, I am a man of constant sorrow. I've seen trouble all my days. And you know, that that's kind of their claim to fame throughout the movie. And one of the few things that they actually did successfully. And truly, the whole movie is about many different kinds of sorrow that um, the people of Mississippi at that point, 1930s, right, right before the great flood of the 1930s, um, experienced from um, the, the um, hard labor and um, brutal treatment on Parchman Farm there in the Delta to the um, being taken advantage of by a supposed um, preacher that sells Bibles, um, but actually took advantage of his position merely to rob them, um, to being, you know, being led astray by their own emotions, um, to you know, wanting to participate in um, the religious and in, in a religious experience, and yet not being committed, and at the same time trying to figure out their own way philosophically by drawing all these illusions. Um, the the main guy, who played by George Clooney, um, is always philosophizing about how life is going to go and how um, they're going to um make it and he's always making these references to the literature that he's read and you know touting himself to be some body right someone who has understanding and wisdom and yet we see right you know clearly right through it that um he's at the mercy of all the circumstances and so it doesn't it's ineffectual um, the divisions of this chapter, the first 16 verses, um, are a deep exploration of pain, but it seems to me that he is documenting a mental pain and anguish. The physical plight of Jerusalem being, um, to overtaken and everything is is over and he's reliving some of those and through that process of his mind going back to those scenes and those sites and you know the questions that it raises and the injustice it seems to me that um, he is experiencing what some of us would call a PTSD and I don't use that term lightly, but it does seem that 
um, he tries to find metaphors for describing the mental pain and anguish that he goes through. And then the next three verses, verse 17 to 21, we have this transition from talking about God in the third person as he, he, he doing all these things to me, as his hand bringing on this, um, this set of physical and emotional and mental and spiritual um, trauma to this transition where he turns his attention and he looks at the Lord and he cries out to the Lord. And then you have this brilliant, in the next verses from verses 22 to 30, you have this just brilliant view of the Lord in his presence and in his and we'll and we'll get to that in just a minute but in in memory of our friends there escaping from parchment farm and writing down the track i i kind of stayed with that theme throughout as we look here at lamentations chapter three it says i am the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath and then it attributes uh, to god all these all these um he he has learned wisely i believe to see that it is god himself that we have to do with right that's the that's the that's the only one i'm um he hath led me and brought me into darkness but not into light so he is in a place mentally emotionally spiritually where he can't see, he has no bearing. He's dark, he's despondent, he's despairing. He is in depression, right? And surely against me is he turned. He turned his hand against me all the day. Not only is he in depression, but the depression is relentless. All the day, it's over and over again. It's um, his hand is against me. His hand is covering me. Verse four: My flesh and my skin hath he made old. That psychosomatic illness, that um, where the 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 because of the 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 experiences of his life he's grown old before his time his flesh his skin is old he's broken his bones he hath builded against me encompassed me with gall and travail this is talking about your gut right um the gall attacks, right? The the constant anxiety has caused him to have probably ulcers. The travail is talking about um, contractions. Um, it's talking about uh, what's the other word? Um, cramps. Just this constant knot in the pit of his stomach that will not let go. He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Not only is, is he in a place of, of darkness and despair, but he's in a place of death. Where it's like he is wandering in, um, in a graveyard. Or maybe he's wandering in the catacombs. I don't know if you've ever done any... Um, study or research or seen anything about the catacombs and the way they worked and the way they were built um, in ancient, from ancient times. But in Europe, um, as a result of the per early persecutions of the church, um, a lot of Christians began to bury their dead, you know, in the catacombs under the underneath the churches. In um, and there would be these caves. And these um, these long tunnels and uh, all these all these earthworks, and they would there would be niches in which 
um, particularly um, the different families would bury their dead um, and to, to be relegated, you know, then in later times, um, during the Reformation times, during the Inquisition, they would literally lock Christians in to these dungeon type situations. And there was no hope, no help, no way out. And they were locked in with the bones and the memories of the past. And if you can you imagine the faces that Jeremiah remembers, the faces of people he, he preached to, the faces of their family, of their children, the faces that he then saw beginning to go through starvation, then he saw them go through the violence of the attacks and the, the siege of Jerusalem. And then he saw them go into um, captivity and be carried off to Babylon. He lives with the, the daily, the minutely memory of these people. He lives with these ghosts, if you will, of people that he has seen, of people who died through that process. And he knows why they died, right? He hath had, Verse 7, He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. So, the chain is so heavy, there's no hope of ever filing through it or breaking out or or, you know, it's like the guy in the Count of Monte Cristo that, you know, he was in the, um, he was, he was on that island of prison and there was no escape. There was no exit out. Um, there was no, there's no hope of getting through. Even if he could get out of the gate. Um, the chain that he was bound by was too heavy for him to drag. He was emaciated. He was weak. Also, when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. Have you ever felt that way? That it doesn't matter what you say or how you pray, that it, it just bounces off the roof and falls right back in your lap. It's like the heavens are shut. No getting out. He hath enclosed my way with hewn stone. He hath made my paths crooked. This is like a um uh what's it called? Um a labyrinth. It's like a labyrinth, a maze where you have these, um, this extensive network of tunnels and walls and things, and every time you try to find your way to escape, you keep going around in circles and coming back where you started. You see all these metaphors he's using to express the, the um, mental and psychological and emotional um, place where he's at at this time. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait, and as a lion in secret places. So now he's got this anxiety. He doesn't dare budge a foot forward because the minute he budges a foot out of line, that bear is ready to pounce. That lion is ready to 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 um whack him, right? Um, that kind of anxiety is very real. Um, to people that they 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 feel this intense fear that that completely paralyzes them and makes them unable to move. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces and hath made me desolate. So instead of success, it's just the opposite, right? Everything he tries fails. Um, everything. You know, he's being stretched, like being stretched on a rock. He's being stretched by circumstances to a point where he feels like he's fixing to pop apart. 
He hath made me desolate. He's lost everything. Or even if he hasn't, there's nothing in life that gives him any pleasure in any of the things that he has. Right? He might as well. There's nothing that's meaningful. There's nothing that's valuable. There's nothing that's worth anything. Not only that, but now he's set him up as a target. God's playing target practice. He's out of practice and he's and he needs a and he needs a target. And so he's using me as his target. He set me up there and he aims and I can feel, I can see, I can sense that that fear, that gripping fear of the of the arrow being lined up against me. And what does he do? He hits a bullseye right right here in the in the center of his body, right there in the in the reins or, or the um the kidneys. The word reins is talking about kidneys. So I don't know if his back was turned or his front, but he says he he hit me right in the kidneys. He caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. And then other people took notice of this um, mental looseness, right? And they started making fun of him and making um, a sport of him and, and um, making comedy and making poetry. And, and you know, this is, this is a topic um, for for um, songs and for jokes and for comedy. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath making me drunken with wormwood. Um, I feel like I'm not even in co in control of my own senses. Right? I'm out of. Um, I can't. I can't stand up. Um, it's like a bad trip. I'm going crazy. My head's about to explode. I'm drunken, but it, I don't have a ha a happy, healthy buzz at all. This is um, absolute wormwood. This is the most bitter, terrible feeling. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones and covered me with ashes. So instead of bread, I'm eating rocks. And covered me with ashes is just lament, pain, sorrow. It's an allusion, of course, to Job and the things that he experienced. But then we see a transition here in Lament, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 17. He said, he, instead of saying, talking about God in the third person, he has led me and he has done this to me. And he has turned against me and he has broken my bones and he has shot at me. Now he uses the word thou. He turns to second person, right? Thou hast removed my soul far off from peace and I forgot prosperity. So because a lack of peace came in, um, there's no peace in his soul, there's no peace in his mind, there's no peace in his mental faculties, his emotions. Um, therefore, he, you know, it has driven out any memory that he had of a better time, a better place, a prosperity. And I said, my strength, and my hope is perished from the Lord. So that lifeline that he had held on to for so long, you know, he's like, you know, that last thread of hope is slipping through his fingers. That last thread of strength that the Lord may come through is, is slipping through his fingers. But then he cries out to the Lord, Lord, remember my afflictions. Remember my afflictions and my misery, the wormwood and the gall.
My, I'm sorry, I, I misread that. I apologize. So the, this is all one sentence, verse 18, 19, and, tw and 20. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord, remembering my afflictions and my misery and the wormwood and the gall. My soul hath them still in remembrance. So he can't remember his prosperity from verse 17. He does remember the pain and the the mental darkness that he's gone through and he says it has what has it done it has caused him to be humble and is humbled in me my soul has them still in remembrance and is humbled in me this i recall to my mind therefore i have hope so you see this transition you, you, the first transition, the first step is moving from talking about God in the third person to talking about God to God in the second person. Still feeling like there's no hope. The last, um, the last sliver of hope is slipping through his fingers, and yet, as as he's counting down, he said, "There's nothing left in my memory. I can't remember. All I remember is pain, suffering. All I remember is um, is dread, anxiety." And he says, "Then this I recall to my mind, and therefore I have hope." See that change, that switch, coming there at the very end of the 21st verse. Verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. You know, we love to quote these verses. These are our favorite verses in the book of Lamentations. You may not know any other verses in the book of Lamentations, but verse chapter three, verse 22 and 23. But notice, that these two verses, verse 22 and 23 of Lamentations 3, come within this context of extreme mental fatigue and um, emotional stress, right? We would like to just lift these two verses out and claim them for ourselves and run away with them, but they came to Jeremiah in the midst of his lament, in the midst of his mourning, in the midst of the both the um the physical going through those moments of trauma and then the mental reliving those traumatic moments in in later days and later years. And there in the midst it was through memory that um, he began to gain perspective. He said, actually, that the, um, that the memory of the pain and the sorrow and the gall and the travail humbled him and lowered his expectation of what can be expected in this world, right? What do we expect is the outcome of a world that has forsaken God? What do we expect is the outcome of a, of a, of a race, the human race, that has forgotten God, that has taken of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when God said, don't take of it. What can we expect but curse and sorrow and death as a result of our own um, sin and our own rebellion and our own turning against the Lord? What else can we expect? We need to be humble about our expectations. Do we expect that we're gonna have this great, this, you know, your best life now? That we're gonna have this great um, 
run of success that we're going to have this this great feeling all the time we're going to just pop out of bed every morning saying hot dog you know what's god got have have for me today that that hum that humility actually was a key turning point my soul hath him still in remembrance and is humbled in me and this i recall to my mind therefore i have hope so it's actually through the process of humility that he was able to come to a more realistic view of what was expected or what was god was going to do for him And that's why he could say in verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. By rights, we should not even be here because of our sin and our rebellion. By rights, we should not have a decent day on this earth. By rights, if we want to talk about what is right and what is fair and what is just, we have received less than our sins deserved. But because his compassions fail not, therefore we are not consumed. Because his mercies are new every morning. Because his faithfulness, not faithfulness to us, but faithfulness to himself. Right? He, God believes in his own qualities more than anything else. He believes that he is a God of love. He believes that he is a God of justice and righteousness. He believes that he is a God of mercy. And because of that, that he found a way within himself, by and through his son Jesus Christ, to fulfill righteousness and yet give us a chance at life. And therefore... His mercies are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. Verse 24, The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Where are you looking for success? Where are you staking your claim? You want to use the terms of the old 49ers going out to California, right? And they would say, okay, I'm going to put my name down. I think I can, I think I can work this, this here piece of real estate and get gold out of it, and they stake their claim, right? Um, Brother Johnny's been preaching through the book of Joshua. What did they do in the book of Joshua? They divided to each, each tribe, and each family, and even each individual person their portion, right? What was their portion? Their real estate, their real property, and their property was their inheritance from the Lord that he had promised them in the land of Canaan. And yet, if you think about it, getting a piece, a, a title deed to a piece of real estate that's cursed. You know, I love my quarter, quarter acre lot here on the corner of Mandalay and 34th, but I have to deal with the blackberry bushes that keep coming back, and I have to be, deal with the um, with the um, the the thorns and the thistles and the briars and all these things. Um, we are blessed in Mississippi with a lot of greenery. We're blessed with great rain and great sunshine, and yet, you know, besides the besides the the desirable vegetation we have all the undesirable vegetation that grows too you know is that really what we want we want um a, a title to real estate of cursed ground is that our ultimate goal and our ultimate hope is that our is that our security i hope you would say no and that the and agree with the author here in this in this lamentation realize you know when everything else is stripped away 
and I have no more security and no more um, ability to enjoy life, the Lord is my portion. I've got a title deed to the Lord. What does it say, man? What does it say in Corinthians? It says he is we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise unto the day of redemption. God gave us a title deed to our eternal inheritance, and it is the presence of the Lord, and it's the presence of his Holy Spirit here with us. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Verse 25, the Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man shall both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Sometimes we feel like we have to stand up for our rights. We have to defend ourselves. We have to, you know, let people know um, they can't go trampling on my rights. What rights do we have? We have a right to real estate in hell. That's what we have a right to. And yet God in his mercy, has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to give us a heavenly home. Ephesians chapter 2 says, Therefore, seated together in heavenly places. He wants us to realize we need to have a resurrection mentality. We need to realize what God has done for us, what he has prepared for us. And so... That being our goal, and that being our expectation, and that being our hope, we need to hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord, because it's not here yet. The kingdom hasn't come. The Lord hasn't returned. This is not paradise. This is not the new Jerusalem yet. But we have hope that that is coming, and it is his presence with us that confirms that hope in our heart. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth, verse 27. It's good. It's okay. We're young. We have a lot to learn. We're young in the Lord, right? We may live 60, 70, 80, 90 years, but we're still young in the Lord. We have a lot of growing to do. We're not ready to see him in glory yet. There's a lot of work that he has to do on us still. And so he's kept us around for to continue that work in us and through us by his Holy Spirit. The young man that's born the yoke in his youth that has seen um, hard toil and struggle early in life, what does he do? Verse 28, he sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne it upon him. He putteth his mouth in the dust, if so be there may be hope. He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him, and he is filled with reproach. Notice how as he talks about the young man bearing the yoke, he transitions right into a direct prophetic saying about the Lord Jesus Christ, who, because, what does it say in Hebrews? It says, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. The Lord himself, Jesus Christ, had to learn obedience by the things that he suffered. He willingly, he voluntarily, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. And why? And is now set down at the right hand. Now he's received his inheritance. Now he's received his real estate. Now he's received his title deed 
right? That throne on the right hand of the Father. Now he can sit down because he bore his, the, the yoke in his youth. This is, we can follow his example. We can learn from him. We can let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but make him, made himself of no reputation and took on him the form of a servant and being found in likeness as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God hath highly exalted him. We can learn from him, but it was only Christ that actually accomplished righteousness through the things that he suffered. It's only Christ who fulfilled the justice of God by paying the penalty for sin. It is only Christ that can vivify us and change our heart and replace the stony heart and give us a heart of flesh and cause us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And therefore, and through that process, be able to love our neighbor as ourself. It is only through Christ that that can be fulfilled. We're coming to the end of um, our meditation today in Lamentations chapter 3. This is the apex of the book of Lamentations. This is the touchstone. This is the capstone. This is the... Um, highest point you'll notice as we go as we as we kind of retreat back down the mountain in lamentations that as he goes down the mountain he goes back into the darkness he goes back into the pain and he goes back into the injustice and he goes back into the anguish both mental and physical and even when we get to the very end of the book of Lamentations, in the end of chapter 5, and there's no resolution, and there's no conclusion, and there's no um, you know, no positivity, yet... We can cling to, and he and he had this moment of rev, of revelation here that God gave him in the midst of his sorrow, that showed him that he was destined for another world. In this world, we're going to have tribulation, but what did Jesus say? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's pray, Father. Tonight, as we look at your word. And as we think about what you've given us and what you've done for us, what you've paid for us, what you've accomplished for us, Lord, what you suffered for us and what you've purchased for us. Yes, Lord, we go through pain. We have mental pain and we have emotional pain and we have spiritual pain and physical pain and that's our lot and yet Christ came and walked with us through it and felt it experienced it submitted to it and shouldered that same pain and gave us words of encouragement and hope and a future and a proposed and a defined end. And we thank you. May your words give us grace that we might see you high and lifted up and that through that we might be drawn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good evening. Looking forward to seeing each one of your faces in the flesh at church Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. God bless you.